Jesus touched a crippled man who then could walk, spoke to a dead child who awoke, broke bread with friends, and then their hearts burned as he explained the scripture to them. He made a paste from dirt and his own saliva to restore sight to the blind man, multiplied loaves and fish to feed the hungry people who followed him, reached out to a leper whose skin was then clean. Time after time, we are told of Jesus physically reaching out to people, healing their broken limbs and feeding their hungry bodies while he mended their broken hearts and nourished their hungry spirits. Jesus did things they could see to teach them about the things they couldn't see. As he touched them physically, he invited them to change spiritually. Hello, I'm Father Michael Tuith, and I'll be your host for What Catholics Believe About Sacraments. I'd like you to stop for just a minute and make a mental picture of some times in your life when someone or something made a profound difference. Maybe the sister you had in third grade gave you a hug when it didn't seem that anyone else cared. Maybe your asthmatic grandfather took time to blow up a balloon when it drained all the breath he had and you felt very special. Can you recall times when you just knew God was responding to you in a special way? Something you could see made a special difference in something you couldn't see. And you felt different inside. There are innumerable ways in which we see, hear, think, or say one thing, and it signifies something else. Any time a tangible sign represents something we can't see, which enhances our relationship with God, it's a sacrament in its broadest sense. In this video, however, we're going to highlight more specifically the seven specialized rituals, the sacraments of the Catholic Church. Theologian Bernard Cook wrote, As knowledge of the sources of the Catholic faith grows deeper and more precise, theologians are becoming increasingly aware that the primitive church saw the sacraments as continuations of those special acts or signs which Christ himself worked. To put it still more graphically, in the Christian sacraments, Christ himself continues the acts he began 2,000 years ago in Palestine. Sacraments, very simply, put flesh on God, today, right now. So here's the first question. We hope it's an easy one. What does the word sacrament mean? A new beginning? A special experience? A sacred sign or symbol? Liturgical celebration? I have a feeling that most of you will get this one right. Let's find out what randomly chosen Catholics think sacrament means. I think though that the word sacrament means all of those. The sacrament is something that we prepare for, that we study for, and then when we receive the sacrament, it is a new beginning. It's a very sacred gift from God. I think, I think it's simple. Um, I think that sacrament is a new sign. It's also a symbol of a new behavior, a new activity that you're going to learn. A uh, sacred sign or symbol. I think it means new beginning. All those who said sacred sign or symbol are right. You probably remember the old Baltimore Catechism definition that a sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. How could we forget? The broadest definition of a sacrament includes any person, event, or thing we experience sensually, which signifies an encounter with God in a new or deeper way. We're given the opportunity to be sacraments in the lives of other people with remarkable frequency. God loved us enough to give us each other and trusted us enough to ask us to take care of each other. Those gifts of love and trust bring with them a great responsibility to bring God into the lives of other people. Each time we do that, we are indeed fulfilling the role of a sacrament. Now that's the broadest sense of the term, but let's look more closely at the seven sacraments which we celebrate as Catholics. The sacraments are meant to be celebrated as a community of God's people, as a private one-on-one -on -one experience between God and individual persons. Some are private and some are community activities. However, it best suits the people involved. Well, what do you think? 
community and a regular individual. I think they're meant to be celebrated as a community of God's believers. I believe they should be celebrated as a community also, but I also think there's a part of a sacrament that's supposed to be personal and individualized. Community. I think that some sacraments are meant to be celebrated within the community and as an individual because I feel like at sacraments like reconciliation, part of the sacrament is celebrated alone and then part is also when you make your first reconciliation, it's with community as a whole. Wrong. <laughs> The correct answer here is that sacraments are meant to be celebrated as a community of God's people. Let's have our resident expert give us an explanation of why sacraments are community celebrations. We are church. We are community. After the resurrection, the disciples began to understand more fully the message of Jesus. They realized that his message revolved around his unity with his Father and his unity with his people. As they came together, Jesus came to them. They experienced the action and power of the Holy Spirit through their unity with Jesus and each other. It was through that unity and that community environment that the sacraments grew and became part of our Catholic heritage. What do the seven sacraments actually do? Fulfill the requirements for being Catholic, effect or bring about what they symbolize, make us sure that we will go to heaven, add some variety to our spiritual activities. I think God, they probably uh, they affect okay. uh, Add some variety to our spiritual activities? I don't really know. Each of the sacraments brings about within us what it symbolizes. Remember those times when you've been changed inside? Notice two aspects of those experiences. On the one hand, there's something you see, feel, touch, experience in some way with your senses. On the other, there's something you comprehend in your mind, feel in your heart, sense in your soul. That's what happens with sacraments. We look beyond what is visible and tangible to experience something priceless, God's presence, God's grace, His love, His Holy Spirit. Jesus introduced one sacrament to make us part of His body, the Church. Which one is that sign of salvation? Confirmation, Eucharist, Baptism, Reconciliation. This one is probably pretty easy. Let's see what some other Catholics think. The Eucharist. Because the Eucharist, the Eucharist is Jesus' body and blood. Baptism. I would say the Eucharist because that is actually where we receive the Lord's body. If you answered baptism, you're right. Baptism is the sacrament which makes us part of the body of Christ, His Church. Baptism is our beginning in the life of faith, our initiation into the family of God. But there must be a continued teaching and ongoing examples of living faith in our lives. Without these, although the sacrament is valid, the full effect of its significance will be lost. What happens after baptism is essential to the fulfillment of the promise of his foundational sacrament. Everything is built on it. It is for this reason that the church prudently requires that the parents of the baby who is to be baptized be living their Catholic faith and be willing to continue to do so an example to the child. The faith of the parents and godparents is crucial in baptism. Without this commitment, the sacrament would be missing, a vital dynamic. Okay, here's a bit of a challenge. What does the word baptism mean? Cleanse, plunge, newness, water. That's a good question. And from the way the, many of the Christian religions do it as a plunge, I would suspect that it means plunge. Baptism to me means new beginning or new birth. It means cleansing and a rebirth, a new birth. Plunge. Plunge. Congratulations if you chose plunge as the meaning of baptism. There's a wonderful symbolism in that word. The word baptism actually means plunging. Jesus was plunged by John into the waters of the River Jordan at his baptism. Later, he referred to his death and resurrection as a baptism. He was similarly plunged into death and raised up by his father. 
Baptism is a sign instituted by Jesus to unite us with his death and resurrection. Here's maybe another challenge for you. What sacrament is a continuance of what began at our baptism? Eucharist, confirmation, reconciliation, holy orders. Probably reconciliation. Confirmation. Confirmation. If you chose confirmation, good for you. At our baptism, we were born into God's family. We became members of the faith community. It's that very community that Jesus called us to. And he promised that he would be with us always. The disciples didn't understand that promise until Pentecost, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But then they had a wonderful new knowledge of what Jesus said to them. They received strength and power to go out and tell the whole world about Jesus. It is that very same Spirit who enters our lives in an active way at our confirmation. We accept the invitation at baptism, but it's only after receiving confirmation that we are given the conviction to love as God loves. We are then able to share his word with the world in the common language of love. Fill in the blank this time. In the rite of confirmation, the celebrant anoints the person and says, be sealed with the gift of love, the Holy Spirit, peace, Christian adulthood. Gift of the Holy Spirit, because, I don't know, it's supposed, that's the time when you become an adult in the church. The Holy Spirit. I think the Holy Spirit. Uh, I think, what was that question? That wonderful gift we receive in confirmation is the Holy Spirit. What more could we ask for? Our Lord made some really big promises to us before he ascended to the Father. He appeared to the very group of deserters who only days before were not with him in his greatest need. In spite of that, without hesitation, he promised to be with them to the end of time. He said, peace be with you. And then he promised the Holy Spirit to make that peace reality. No way was he going to leave us on our own. He knew what disaster that would be. Instead, he promised us a very special gift, the Holy Spirit. At confirmation, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, whose deepened presence within us is meant to sustain us in a lifetime of witness to Jesus Christ and service to other people. Catholics believe that the Eucharist is actually the body and blood of Jesus, represents the body and blood of Jesus, represents the bread and wine used at the Last Supper, is the body and blood of Jesus only in the act of giving from one person to another. The body and blood of Christ. Does it represent the body and blood of Christ or is it actually the body and blood of Christ? It represents what Jesus passed around at the Last Supper as his body and blood actually is the body and blood of Christ. I, I, I always thought that the Eucharist was the, the body and blood of Christ, and that's what the most special part of the Mass, to me, always, always was. I think some of the other interpretations are also true, though, too, in that it does represent the bread and the wine used at the Last Supper, because that is also goes back to that part of the Mass. And, you know, at the Last Supper, you know, that's when he offered up, you know, his... Um, he turned the bread and the wine into and said, this is my body, that this will be given up for you. So I think it, and it also becomes very special in, in receiving it from another person, too. So I, I think you can probably use a lot of those interpretations, but I do actually believe that it is actually the, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. If you answered that the Eucharist is truly the body and blood of Jesus, you were correct on this most important aspect of our Catholic faith. I'll let our expert elaborate. As Catholics, we believe that the Eucharist is the body and blood of Jesus, pure and simple. Not just under certain specific circumstances, 
not just a reminder or a reenactment, but the actual body and blood of our Savior. As Jesus said in the synagogue in Capernaum, Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I shall raise him up on the last day. Just as wheat and grapes are crushed to make bread and wine for communion, so too Jesus Christ was crushed for our communion. He gave everything that we might have everything. In this greatest mystery of our faith, bread and wine actually become the body and blood of Christ. And when we receive the Eucharist, He penetrates our very being, and we are one with Him. As St. Paul taught us, it no longer makes a difference who we are or what we are. What matters only is that we are one with Jesus Christ. This is an interesting question about a topic which comes up frequently among people who are Catholics and non-Catholics alike. Some people prefer to confess their sins directly to God instead of to a priest. But in our Catholic faith, why do we believe it's important to confess them to another human being? We can't be forgiven unless we go to a priest. The priest represents both God and our community, both of whom we offend when we sin. Father gets lonely sitting all by himself in the little room on Saturday afternoon. We need a fire and brimstone lecture from the priest and penance to make everything all right. I don't think because he's lonely, just because he kind of he represents God. Um, I believe that we go to the priest to tell him our sins because he's the individual that comes between me and God and is more open to bring God to me than if I just talk to God. Because he um, stands as a symbol of the rest of the church, and uh, we beg forgiveness from all the community. We, when we sin, we don't just do things individually, but we do it at, against the community. It, our failings hurt them also. I think that we go to the priest because the priest is our linkage to God, and the priest also is part of the community in our sin. Although it's personal, it's also part of the community. If you have tucked away in your memory some of those explosive experiences in a small, dark confessional sometime in your past, you might, unfortunately, have chosen the last answer. But the answer we were looking for this time is the priest represents both God and the community in the entire picture of sin and forgiveness. Let's listen to our experts speak about this much maligned sacrament, which presents a marvelous opportunity to grow if we understand it properly. A priest represents both the heavenly Christ and the body of Christ on earth in the sacrament of reconciliation. When we sin, we mar our own personal relationship with God. But beyond that, we affect our relationship with the whole community. There's truly no such thing as a private sin. The tentacles of sin are far-reaching. I may have no idea of the extent of harm I have done. But through sacramental confession, we are reconciled not only with God, but also with the community. When we apologize for something, that's good. But when we actually celebrate the sacrament of forgiveness, when we experience the visual sign and the internal change, that's truly good. As a priest, I hear this a lot. Some people say that they're uncomfortable confessing to a priest because of what he will think about them. So, agree or disagree? If priests were honest about it, wouldn't they admit that they think less of a person who has come and told them how they've sinned? Agree, disagree. I disagree. Well, priests are human, so they probably couldn't help that thinking differently of people that have told them certain sins? I don't think so. I think that the priests hear so much about what people are doing or saying and thinking that it all becomes part of their whole life, and I don't think that they think any less of a person. Needless to say, this question involves the human condition, which exists for our clergy, just like it does with others in the church. Everybody's different, so there's no cut and dried answer to this one. But I think you might find it interesting to hear what our clergy have to say about this one. You might be surprised. For myself, there is probably no experience of priesthood that is more powerful than that of hearing confessions. 
when a person confesses to me his or her sinfulness, I have never felt less about that person. I only am amazed at the ability of another human being to to tell me of, of what he or she did and to see in me as a priest the power to actually forgive them. This, this sacrament, probably more than any of the other sacraments, actually touches me and makes me feel I am truly doing the Lord's work of bringing people closer to, to the Lord. Well, first of all, I feel very privileged and humbled uh, to be a priest in the confessional. I think it's probably one of the greatest sacraments we have, and yet one of the most misunderstood. As a priest, what you see and hear in a confessional are people at their best, not at their worst. People who come before God, admitting their mistakes and their frailty, all of their humanity, and you see them struggling to be good and to become better Christians. And as a priest, we're God's ministers to take the burden off of their backs, to let them know and to feel and to experience God's compassion, his forgiveness, and his love. And I think one of the great joys as a confessor is to see people's eyes light up, knowing that their burdens have been taken and they can go out free to live the lives of Christians as they try. I'd like to add to those observations my own experience of being a priest in the confessional and really experiencing the privilege of getting a glimpse into people's souls. What I often find is that more than just forgiveness, the person needs a deep emotional healing. They need to know that Christ understands and can bring relief and comfort and courage and a whole new way of approaching the deep problems and pains they have in their lives. So for me as a priest, hearing confessions is really quite a privilege. So on to the next question. The story of Jesus' first miracle is the topic of many homilies you've heard over the years, I'm sure. Where did Jesus perform his first miracle? The wedding feast of Cana? His own baptism in the Jordan River? During dinner with Martha and Mary? sharing a cup of water with the woman at the well. The wedding feast in Cana. The wedding in Cana. The wedding feast at Cana. I bet all of you knew that Jesus performed his first miracle at the wedding feast of Cana. To begin with, Jesus added to the sanctity of marriage by his very presence at the wedding feast. He was just there to celebrate with the rest of the guests when his mother mentioned that they had no more wine. His response was guarded, and yet she knew she could count on him to come through for his host. And so, Jesus performed his first miracle, the changing of water into wine. Jesus began a new phase of his life, his public ministry, at a wedding, much as a young couple begins a new phase of life together when they receive the sacrament of matrimony. On another occasion, Jesus responded to a question by saying, From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no human being must separate. Through his miracle at Cana and words he spoke on other occasions, Jesus made clear the sanctity of marriage, which has come down to us as one of our seven sacraments. What sacrament is dignified as the symbol of Christ's relationship with the church? Baptism, Eucharist, holy orders, matrimony. Have you got your answer in mind? Here's what some of your cohorts have to say. Holy orders. Matrimony. Oh, boy. I would have to say first holy orders um, because that is making a special commitment and pledge and lifetime commitment to the church. Um, and that would, you know, symbolize, I guess, Christ's relationship to the church because he, he gave up his, his life for us and, and really, you know, nuns and priests are, are giving, up, giving up their lives and really donating it to the church. 
The correct answer is matrimony. As far back as St. Paul, the relationship of the church to Christ has been compared to that of husbands and wives. Paul used the term sacred sign, which was translated in Latin as sacramentum. Father David Hassel goes a step further when he compares the compenetration of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to the compenetration of husband and wife in marriage. The sacredness of marriage continues to be an important part of our Catholic faith. For this reason, the Church has come to realize the importance of preparing for the sacrament. It is imperative that the two people who marry one another be fully aware of the commitment and the beauty of their sacrament in the eyes of the Church and in the eyes of God. It's more than just a contract. It's a covenant between a man and a woman, much like the covenant between God and his people. A contract implies, what will I get out of it? A covenant is a promise of what we will put into the relationship. Vatican Council II defined marriage as the intimate partnership of life and love. And that indeed is what the church has with God as well. One of the sacraments we don't hear a lot about is the sacrament of the healing of the sick. But true or false? A person must be at death's doorstep or very close to it to receive the sacrament of the sick. True or false? False. True. It's false. True. It's false. Because uh, we did in our church, they had just there were a whole bunch of people do it, and none of them were almost dying. I, th I, th I heard you had to be on your deathbed receive that no way that's false man. definitely false because I've received it and I'm alive and well <laughs> the answer is false truly a person doesn't need to be close to death to receive the sacrament probably some confusion exists from a former time when the sacrament had a different name and a different thrust the, the term they used to call is extreme unction and people automatically would think that when they saw the priest coming that, that means that they were close to death, and it always brought more grief for the family as well as for the person who's sick. Well, now, in the, in the recent times, it's more of the, the whole anointing of the sick would be more in terms of, of comfort, bringing the Holy Spirit to the person and to the family and to the people who were present at the time of the anointing. Why do we have priests? We've all been called to be a priestly people of God, called to ministry in the church, if that's true, why do we need ordained priesthood at all? It's a good idea for someone to be in charge to make sure things are done properly. There are certain functions which can only be performed by an ordained priest because Jesus called them to serve specifically. Some of us just look good in black. We actually could probably get along nicely if we didn't have priests, but they're part of our heritage. It's a dirty job, but somebody has to do it. Now be careful with this one. This question's a little personal. I'm most anxious to hear why people think we exist in the Catholic Church. How about you? There are only certain functions that the priest can do because he was chosen by Jesus. We have priests act as a liaison between the church, the people, and God, I believe. The answer is that there are certain functions which only an ordained priest can perform. There are many capacities in which we Catholic priests may and do contribute to the community, but there are some reserved only for ordained priests. For example, only an ordained priest may preside at the Eucharistic celebration of Mass during which bread and wine are consecrated into the body and blood of our Savior. Only priests may give absolution for sins. Jesus called them to these ministries at the Last Supper. A priest is ordained to act in the person of Jesus Christ, and through him, regardless of human failing, Christ is made present. Well, that's it. I hope you've learned a thing or two to help you along your own faith journey. The sacraments are a deep and rich part of our Catholic faith. They give life to us, to our church community, to other people. The sacraments are the best way we know 
to see and know God in our midst. Until next time, I'm Father Michael Tuath. Thanks for joining us on this edition of What Catholics Believe.